is episode number 138. My name is Matt Brown, joined each and every week by the brightest minds in all of the gaming industry with me. I have Dustin Galker. I have Adam Candy. You can find them on the Twitter machine for free, and you should at Dustin Galker at Adam Candy 2 E's. No why. And of course, everything we talk about here on the podcast, you can read those fine words over at LegalSportsReport.com. Guys, we are going to talk about 888. We are going to talk about what's going on in South Carolina. We're going to talk about California a little bit, the state roundup as always with Adam. But hey, look, let's uh, let's kick things off here in just a general discussion between you guys for some interesting stuff that came out of some calls here recently. And it is kind of the, is this phase two or is it phase three even? I don't know. Maybe, maybe phase one was just getting things going. Phase two was customer acquisition mode. Phase three is what we are maybe moving into now or whatever. But, you know, we hear some stuff about Caesars. We hear some stuff about Churchill Downs. We hear some stuff about Bally's, things like that. So I'm just curious, um, and let's kick things off with just kind of like the Caesars statements that we heard this past week, Adam. Like, you know, are we kind of heading into... Are we kind of heading into phase three or four or wherever you kind of see us in this whole grand, you know, game that we're playing here? Yeah, Matt, this is a situation that kind of goes back to last week a little bit with the Caesars earnings call and our coverage from Brad Allen, where he reported on the comments about Tom Reeg saying they're going to pull back from TV advertising for the most part because they had accomplished their goals. And that was sort of the first of what kicked off to be a week of these interesting pieces of news that have to do with either companies pulling back or pulling out or the companies that are sort of doubling down on their presence saying, yeah, we'll be here to take those customers if uh, you're backing off in some way. So we heard also the Churchill Downs uh, is going to wind down its Twin Spires brand, which quite honestly uh, never really made any sort of dent in U.S. sports betting or in online casino either. But their CEO with similar kind of comments about how this is an overheated market, right? How it is very difficult to make a profit and that they're going to get out of it for now. Beyond that, we look at Bally's, who has been delaying their relaunch of their 2.0 sort of product after acquiring GameSys and Betworks and so on, saying, you know what, if we go out there right now with a huge push with a bad product, uh, we feel like we're going to be behind the eight ball like some of these other places have ended up and we don't want to be there. And then you have companies in the vein of Flutter and FanDuel, along with PointsBet to a lesser degree, saying... Yeah, you know, we think our product is in pretty good shape, and in the end, yeah, people might jump to promos, but product is going to win out in the long run. And we kept hearing this, guys, over the course of the last couple of years, right? Product will win. Product will win. Kind of seems like we're at the point now where it's time to put up or shut up when it comes to that, because... If that promo environment is going to die down a little bit, and I say a little bit because it's not like the free money just isn't there anymore. Maybe it's just that it's not as frequent or as large, but it seems like maybe we are moving into another phase here that maybe kind of started with Win pulling out a few months ago and the fact that we got that canary in the coal mine of maybe this market isn't as heated as it used to be. Dustin, it was, it, you know, again, we, we saw this, uh, through the other forms of gaming, right? I mean, like in the poker days, in the DFS days, stuff like that, like everyone comes out hot and heavy, then there's either mergers and acquisitions or there's just people who kind of bow out along the way. Uh, or, or, you know, I know this is a little bit different than the, the even the poker days, which at that point was still gray market stuff and the DFS days, because DFS, again, is just a, uh, one thing about that is, right? I mean, you just, you you can't make any more bets after the game starts. It's a, it's a different type of product than, than sports betting is altogether. Plus, you can bet sports just around the clock, depending on what sports you'd like to bet. If you want to bet stuff overseas, you can bet stuff overseas, you know, different things like that. But when we kind of see here, Churchill dipped their toes in in other things before and then didn't really kind of go all in, and then they ended up pulling out. And so we've kind of seen this before with them. Bally's looked like they have been really slow to get things going as it was anyway. So it's not really surprising to hear anything from this, I guess is the, is the most surprising thing here really just what, what Caesars came out and said, is that what really jumps off the page to you? 
yeah, I mean, people like I think this is it definitely feels different, right? Let's get that let's start there. It feels like the last like post Super Bowl or just this first quarter or whatever, it all feels different to me than it did. You feel you see people reacting to what these companies are selling and you know, they're nobody's really excited about you know growing market share and spending zillions of dollars to acquire that market share. So that's that's the underlying all of this, I think, uh, is that then yeah, you see you see Caesars like Caesars spent a lot of money over a very short amount of time and arguably didn't, I mean, didn't really get a great return. We see it in New York. They led New York right away with a total amount of wagers. They are already down to probably third uh, moving forward behind DraftKings and FanDuel again, not in reverse order, actually. Um, but yeah, you see, it just feels different. Like this, this, it feels like we have moved in. If phase one was the land grab of the first four years uh, post pass, but we are into, you have, it's, it is like Adam said, put up or shut up. You have to, you can't just put out this huge promo like Caesars did. And then you don't retain any of your customers, right? That they, or not gain a huge amount of market share. That is not going to excite anyone. Churchill looks at it and says, we're not going to be able to compete. I probably could have told them that uh, a while ago <laughs> with, uh, with between the product and brand, but I mean, they made it just uh, what I think is a smart decision because they, yeah. they probably just weren't going to compete. Um, and yeah, like I think makes a hundred percent, like if you're talking about product and moving forward and winning, and it's not just uh, getting as many customers as, as, as possible in the door right now, look at Bally's and you say like they have bought a lot of things and they, you get kind of, you get a great shot at it right at the beginning, right? It wasn't like at the beginning when we had DraftKings, FanDuel, a couple others, and you kind of just opened up and you were fine. You have to, I think you have to be a little smarter about it, especially if you're not prepared to spend a zillion dollars uh, for front so yeah it, as i look as uh it's it is just interesting all this news and all this chatter it's just a bunch of little nuggets but it does it does amount to it feels like things are different right now in sports betting in the u.s and and adam you know we look at we talk about sometimes these like sleeping giants we talked about 365 before sitting back and all that and then you do have points bet that is sitting there saying, you know, maybe they'll be able to come in and get some of these customers and they kind of, they haven't really spent, but kind of spent. I mean, you know, like it depends on what you consider spending. You don't see points bet commercials all the time, but you do see these partnerships and different things that they've done. Um, one of the things that we're just not really saying with all this is, you know, of course we're focusing on Caesars now. MGM is, is kind of who they are with that. I'll admit where, you know, I was wrong in all of this and, I understand we're still early, but it doesn't seem like it's trending in the right direction where I thought these kind of household names, brands that people knew and recognized, and you can physically go to Caesars Casino and you can physically go to MGM Casino and your state of choice, and you can go in there and get wined and dined and, you know, whatever and all the stuff like that. And that would translate over into, you know, people just naturally flocking to your brand for sports betting. And at least so far, that has not really been the case, so I was I was certainly dead wrong on that. I don't know that you're wrong overall, though, because look at the way MGM and Caesars have pivoted the marketing of their sportsbook apps over the last few months especially, right? One of the major pushes that Caesars has attached to its sportsbook is the only place you can get Caesars rewards, right? This is the only yeah. one that has our rewards program. And now, I can tell you just driving by the airport in Las Vegas over the last few days, the BetMGM ads have now shifted to, yes, you can earn for that, right? Mm -hmm. And they're showing people at the spa, and they're showing people with the sports book. It seems to me that the legacy companies are trying to now use that as an advantage in a way that maybe they hadn't been earlier on, seeing that just trying to compete on tech, just trying to compete on odds, whatever the case might be, it might not be enough yeah. uh, against some of the bigger companies that are more in that tech space, like DraftKings, like FanDuel. To the point about points bet, I think it's important that we talk about this because um, we had the story out today about Apollo potentially wanting to merge Yahoo Sports with a sportsbook company that is existing. And look, we've kind of beaten around this bush a little bit over the last year or two. But when you look at the market share of a company like points bet, then you see, okay, it's respectable. Uh, it hasn't necessarily broken through to the level that I think they were hoping, especially if Illinois had stayed in person all the way through the way they were kind of planning. And 
would that be an acquisition target for someone like that? Uh, you were looking at a market cap uh, around what seven hundred fifty million or so is what was thrown out recently for points bet, um, which feels more realistic than play up trying to talk about uh, four hundred and fifty when it was uh, floating that story out there in the Mintos lawsuit not that long ago. So, yeah, that could be part of this phase as well. Is that companies like? You know, Churchill Downs with Twin Spires might just throw their hands up and say, nah, nah, we're good. Mm -hmm. uh, other companies that might sort of see the writing on the wall, not necessarily points bet, but we use them in this example, might be the ones to say, hey, you know what? Maybe it's time to cash out while we still can. And you mentioned Apollo. I mean, Apollo just closed on the Venetian Palazzo here in Vegas. So they would also be able, if they wanted to go that route of, you know, tying a land-based property into you know, the things like that, they could also do that as well. And, and Adam, I'm glad you brought that point up because, you know, for, for us living here in Vegas, one of the only things we ever did get from any sort of reward standpoint is the local casino group here, Station Casinos, you could actually earn points by betting on their app, right? And all things, if all things were created equal across the board, if I was getting the exact same number dealt to me at, at, at stations that I was at any of the other places, I placed the bet at stations because I was getting points, right? I mean, like, why wouldn't I, if I'm, if I'm not losing anything by, by, you know, some, some equity in the number that they're, dish, that they're dealing me. And so it worked on me and I'm a pretty seasoned, better gambler or whatever and stuff like that. So I think if that is kind of the pivot here from Caesars and MGM, I, I certainly think it's, it's something that can work at least on some people, right? I agree entirely because of the fact that I did the same thing Yeah, because I have a station property that is less than a mile from my house. And when I first signed up for an account, the bonus was not in money. It was in points. And mm -hmm. I took those points and I went to my pre-COVID favorite, the buffet, and <laughs> yeah. cashed in my points at the buffet and mm -hmm. thought, well, this is fun. I can get my uh, I can get my meals through this. So I totally understand where it could work for people, especially when you look at MGM Caesars, companies that are multi-state operators that have properties all over the country that can market regionally in terms of cashing in some of these things. You know, if you live in the South and you want to go to, you know, Beau Rivage, if you want to go to uh, National Harbor, you know, in Maryland, like there are options for them. Dustin, let's uh, let's talk about 888 here. Um, there was uh, something over in the UK here that caught our eye. Yeah, well, uh, it caught a lot of people's eyes, I think. 888 got hit with a $12.5 million fine. It was mil dollars, not euros, I think. Uh, we're translating here for our, for our folks. But by the UK Gambling Commission for failing to protect vulnerable customers. Um, uh, it's a largest date, largest fine for this for the date, according to UK GEC. Um, and uh, they even hinted at the fact that if 888 continues to fail to protect customers for like, checking finances before when people deposit a lot of money or, or what have you, or busting through deposit caps that they could be uh, could be seriously considered for getting rid of their license in the uk uh 888 is not not been a big player here in the u.s they operate as si sports illustrated sportsbook in colorado right now and have designs on moving that brand across but let, let's imagine if this story had dropped in the u.s though at so if some operator had done all of this here in the u.s we always say we fear what happens when there's this big responsible gambling story or some big scandal. Like if, if U S customer, if this was happening to U S customers to some great degree, uh, I'd be worried about it for the sake of sports betting here in the U S it, it would be very problematic. Um, and also a big problem. This is the, hopefully this is not going on to, to great effect it, uh, at us facing sports books, but you know, this is a company that has a, as a foothold here and is, is now under scrutiny in the UK. So, uh, you know, pretty big story, even though it didn't come in the U S this is a, uh, this is a, 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 a tale for us to, to watch. Um, cause the, you, you do not want to see the repeat of this in the U S or else sports betting is going to, uh, develop much differently, I think, if we see a lot of this or any examples of this to great degree here with, with U.S. sports books. Adam, we don't like to give publicity to people who make asinine statements, but I think this is one of those cases where it is worth bringing up for the fact that this is this is still what is like going on out there, right? I mean, like, yes, it, yes we do have mobile sports betting legal in a, in a you know, healthy amount of states at this point as we sit here in beginning of March in 2022, but there are people out there who still have a mindset that this is like, you know, the worst thing that could possibly happen. They still have the mindset that I'm going to say something so incredibly hyperbolic to try to get my point home 
that, you know, listen, it resonates with some people out there. If some people believe anything that they hear, some people only, you know, listen to these crazy headlines and stuff like that. And so I think it's worth us bringing this up for out of uh, South Dakota where we can say, okay, look, guys, we're all for understanding, you know, that some people are trying to get things done and they say things that are ridiculous, but let, let's pipe it down a little bit. Just to put a cap on what Dustin was talking about with that twelve and a half million dollar fine before we get to uh, the great state of South Dakota, uh, keep in mind, and Matt knows this, CG, which uh, ultimately was bought out by William Hill here in Nevada, CG had racked up in the neighborhood of four million dollars of fines over the course of years for pass posts, for uh, out of state bets, for a number of things. That was a company that was threatened with shutdown for violating over and over again regulations that were clear. We're talking about three times that in the UK over RG. Like, this is something that is absolutely worth uh, our attention uh, to keep watching. Now, this is not worth our attention, <laughs> but we have to talk about it. Yeah. Um, let's, let's go up to South Dakota, where on Friday the House State Affairs Committee uh, voted against a Senate resolution that would have taken South Dakota sports betting mobile. That effectively kills mobile for this year in South Dakota. Um, that's fine. It happens. You know, legalization is not necessarily a straight line for any state that chooses to do it. Some try multiple times. Some decide they just want to stay with retail like Mississippi has for many years now. Um, this is where it becomes a bit of an issue. Department of Revenue Deputy Secretary David Wiest spoke against the resolution. Um, first of all, I kind of want to know why we're getting salacious comments from the Department <laughs> of Revenue Deputy Secretary. <laughs> Seems like maybe a bit out of place from the executive branch. But here's his quote about what might be happening if we choose to expand to mobile sports betting in South Dakota. It strikes me that people have been doing lots of stuff illegally. Should we strike those laws too? How about theft? How about murder? <laughs> I'm going to try to sum this up the best way yeah. I can. If you're going to use the slippery slope argument, understand that when you use the slippery slope argument, it is never as slippery as your grasp on reality <laughs> appears to be when you use it. It is one of those things, like I said, I mean, it has to be brought up when we're sitting here talking about this stuff because it's just like it, th these things get said and like these things get said by people who for better or worse, hold at least some amount of power within these states and whatever. And so like you just look at this and you're like, what, what are we what are we what are we doing here like why there's got to be a better way even if you do disagree with something doesn't just to put kind of a bow on this though whenever we we talk about these states that continue to be you know uh, uh, land-based only and, and not have the online i mean we saw louisiana whenever they sh they flipped the switch they took basically as many bets in four days over <laughs> online as they did over the tire whole time that they were sitting there and they were only brick and mortar. Uh, Wyoming takes in, you know, $12 million in online bets during the month of December and Wyoming as, you know, 300,000 fewer people than South Dakota. So, I mean, you start to look at this and you got Deadwood that's coming in at 835 grand in total wagers. And you realize that they are literally leaving millions of dollars on the table. Yeah. I mean, you basically shouldn't even bother legalizing sports betting if you're not going to legalize the online component. You're, I mean, yes, if you're a casino, cool, it's an amenity, but like, there's just no point to it anymore. Um, a couple other footnotes to South Dakota. One, I've listened to a lot of, of legislative hearings in my day, and this is probably the most ridiculous comment, which is saying something because I've I've heard a lot of them. <laughs> uh, but this is pretty this is pretty bad and pretty up there. I'm also I'm sad for South Dakotans because you're not going to be able to bet online. I'm also sad for our readers that you're not going to have whatever whatever great headline Adam had cooked up uh, for South Dakota if they had legalized online sports betting. That's in the can. Hopefully, we'll see that in a, in a future year. I'm just going to say when Colorado legalized, I had that headline ready for months before it actually went. So which was which some, was uh, Rocky Mountain Eye. Ah, uh, I uh, see what we yeah. did there. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yes, we will have something dreamed up for uh, whenever South Dakota legalizes or whenever we get another quote like comparing <laughs> sports betting to murder. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Dustin, let's head over to California, one of the, again, one of the crown jewels that's still left out there, and we are, you know, it looks like we're trying to gauge the, you know, take take the temperature here of the people of California, and what are they, what do the people say? 
yeah, we got a poll from Cal Berkeley uh, about sp- California sports betting and the the ballot measures that we're going to see uh, in 2022. Uh, the good news uh, favored uh, on the top line, 45 to 33 uh, percent favored sports betting or of, of some sort to happen in the mm. state, which is certainly good news if you'd like to bet on sports in California. That's a very vague question, though. There are going to probably be multiple ways that you could vote for sports betting, and uh, that could that could take a toll on whether any one of them passes or ha- which one passes. But the other big part is that people are just undecided. It's not something that's really tracked with the public. Tw- almost a fifth of the voters in the state, on the, according to this poll, have are undecided on the measure. So there's a lot to uh, or any of the measures. There's, there's, there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, the, the, the real lobbying and, and uh, spend around this that will come from operators, the tribes, uh, the leagues and teams themselves, that's all yet to come in California, but it will it will shape people's opinions and go there. But for, it's, a, it's at least, if you're looking at it very top level, this is a good starting point for California sports betting. And not shocking if you don't have, like, people, like, this has been the case in other states where we've seen polling. I think that, you know, generally people are, like, you know, there's no, the aversion to gambling is pretty low these days. Gambling has become pervasive. Sports betting is is not seen as quite the the same vice as other forms of gambling. So pretty pretty good start starting point for California sports betting once we get to these uh, these ballot measures in the fall. And Adam, we also have just some some kind of the behind the scenes grassroots stuff going on by some of the. Uh, bigger names in the industry as well, trying to get enough signatures to get something on a ballot, correct? Right. I mean, you could see as many as four initiatives qualify for the ballot in California. The only one you're sure to see right now is the one backed by uh, some of the tribes that would be retail only. Now you have DraftKings and FanDuel backing another one that would go mobile. You have another one that would be uh, supporting card rooms. Uh, Those have not qualified as yet. I think to Dustin's point, though, to add something about the idea of it's not the vice that people uh, once saw it as, I think you'd only need to look as far as how this has been pitched in different places in the country, right? When we were trying to get this qualified for the ballot in Florida, it was about education, the Florida education champions. Uh, In California, the operators are trying to make it about homelessness. We're going to solve homelessness in California. In New York, where they were successful in ultimately getting some form of mobile, it was about supporting youth sports programs. So we're okay with tying sports betting to all of these much larger social issues that we're going to solve in all of these large states in the U.S. And look, and look, getting money to homeless people is to the homeless problem in California is a noble goal. This is not going to solve homelessness in Los Angeles. I even think I saw a story saying, could could uh, sports betting solve homelessness in in California? No, 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 no. it's not solving homelessness. Yes, you can get some money to people who need it. Uh, but that, that sports betting does not solve is not the amount of money being raised by sports betting is not solving society's ills in any state. Adam, as always, take us home with our little state roundup here. Let's start in Virginia, where we had some discussion of potentially ending the in-state college betting ban that had been enacted there, and then we didn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, That one has ended for the year. And I thought what was interesting about that discussion was the argument from legislators saying, well, part of the original deal we made about being okay with sports betting is that we wouldn't have betting on in-state colleges. So we don't want to go back on that deal. Uh, I also think you can have an approach that evolves with looking at saying Um, what has this limited in terms of the market when you have large universities in big conferences like Virginia and Virginia Tech? And what is the potential detriment here? We're making it sound as though uh, not being able to offer legal wagering on these is going to stop wagering on these colleges in state. No, it's just happening with bookies and happening offshore. So it's an argument that's never made a whole lot of sense to me, but in Virginia, it's an argument that uh, is going to be in power for at least a little while. Now, let's take a look close to home there in Maryland, where we just seem to make turtle-like progress in Maryland. Part of the law was about including more minority and women-owned businesses in the potential for getting a sports betting license for some of the lower class uh, of licenses. So, Great, obviously. Uh, It's it's an industry that lacks diversity in a lot of ways. However, the process for just getting a study looking at the best way to do this has been so painfully slow with the committee in Maryland that 
you're looking at well into 2023 here before you're going to get legal mobile sports betting in Maryland. And the real problem with that is that voters approved this in 2020. And the legislature came around to it in 2021 to put the enacting legislation to it. But we're looking at wasting almost an entire year. And I don't say that wasting Mm -hmm. means that the study is wasted. I just mean wasted time overall in terms of being able to get this market up and running. And inclusion is a great goal for it in terms of the rest of getting this market going. I think you're going to see that if Virginia is able to uh, get a real market going and... Who knows if Washington, D.C. <laughs> ever decides to end the gambit folly that Maryland could be working from a fair amount behind by the time it gets itself into the game in any way, which would, of course, not benefit any of the businesses. Minority and women owned businesses certainly would not be able to have the same uh, revenue stream if the market overall is not able to emerge the way that you would hope it might. So uh, that's the state of affairs there. Uh, Elsewhere in the U.S., uh, I feel like now that we are about 26 minutes into this podcast, I need to make clear that um, we are going to mention New York. Uh, they've already taken a billion dollars in handle in February. Big surprise with the Super Bowl uh, in there. But yes, New York continues to be hot even without as many promo dollars. Guys, everything that we talk about here on the podcast, you can find over at LegalSportsReport.com. Go in, take in the words Adam and his team are doing. Awesome, awesome stuff going on over there all the time. You can follow Dustin on the Twitter machine at Dustin Galker. You can follow Adam on the Twitter machine at Adam Candy 2 es no Y. And if you hate yourself, you can follow me at Matt Brown M2. Spotify, Stitcher, Google, all the places that you get all of your podcasts. We really do appreciate that as well. Go in and subscribe, rating, and review it. For Dustin, for Adam, I'm Matt. Talk to you guys this week.